So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Kate Sunderland, and uh, I work, I'm a business development manager in the professional development team at Cardiff University. I'm really delighted to welcome you all to this session this morning, and uh, really looking forward to hearing uh, and learning more about ethics in AI. Um, before we uh, start the session, I just wanted to remind people that um, if you have questions, um, to please use um, the Q and A facility, and we'll uh, we'll take those at the end of the, the session. Um, so now I would uh, like to introduce you today to today's speaker, um, who is Louise um, from the School of Computer Science and Informatics. Thank you very much. Mm. Hello, Kate and everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen and we can get uh, started with the talk. It's, I guess it should be fine by now. Um, Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Luis, I'm a, a, a lecturer at the School of Computer Science. And uh, what, well, what uh, we're going to cover today um, is uh, one of the, of the topics that we typically cover also in our, in our MSc uh, programs uh, on data science and software engineering, um, which is, um, well, um, Kind of an overview of what it means not to make uh, uh, have ethical approaches to to applications to computer applications that deal with data in some form so um yeah let's uh, let's uh, get started um and hopefully by the end of the of the session um actually the goal no uh, is not to give you a lot of answers but rather to uh, leave you with uh, even more questions and critical questions, especially, you know, if in your regular um, activity, um, if you're involved in education or in industry, um, and there's any contact with data in any, in any form, um, well, leave, leave you with, um, with um, uh, a critical outlook, no, uh, into what it means to, 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 to deal with data and what implications that can have uh, down the line. Um, so to give a bit of context, no, um, we're going to talk about uh, AI and data science almost interchangeably. Um, at the end of the day, what we're going to be talking about is um, uh, what kind of considerations do we need to uh, take into account when we uh, are dealing with uh, uh, well um, um, uh, data coming mostly from uh, human users, right? Uh, because this has uh, several implications that we it's it's um, it's highly advisable that we kind of follow them follow certain um, well uh, regulations and, and uh, best practices uh, from the ethical uh, legal and social point of view um, data science is a technology um, and we do have um, 
uh, examples in the past where the uh, every time no, a new technology has been brought uh, into society, there has been a phenomenon uh, called the uh, dual uh, use, um, which basically means um, um, that the intended uh, first uh, use of a new technology kind of uh, well gives way no, to others that uh, are were not intended in the in the first place. Um, but it can even be the case that um, they kind of overtake no in some in some cases the the initial use. Um, one of the best examples of dual use is the case of um, of um, so electricity no as you can see um, um, in the in the slide. Uh, which was um, invented in 1879. Um, the, 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 the record for uh, when the first London streets were lit was only a couple of years later in 1881. Um, but turns out that the first man uh, executed with electric chair was only a few years later, no, in 1890. Uh, so you can, it kind of seems safe to assume that this application of that technology was not among, you know, the main applications that the inventors of, of, uh, of electricity had in, in mind and the, and, and the people behind the deployment, no, at large scale. Um, and this is um, hands down the, the, the same uh, situation as with data science. Um, and we'll give a bit of context of why um, this is the case and how can we uh, manage no, the, 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 o the obvious uh, advantages and contributions that data science and data-driven applications have in, in society with their unintended um, um, implications and uh, the dual use. Um, so if you're not uh, very familiar now with what we need to kind of do data science, uh, we basically need uh, three things, not data science AI. Yeah, no, we, we basically need three things. Um, we need algorithms. So we need uh, computer programs that are able to kind of learn uh, how the world works uh, from data. Um, we need the data. So we need to acquire data, which is representative of a problem, of a scenario, of a population. And we need computing power. So we need uh, good hardware that's capable to, of running uh, large scale experiments um, in order to train these algorithms on the data we have. Um, that's, it's not been the case, uh, it's not always been the case that we had access to this stuff, um, but now it's almost a commodity. Um, it's easy and to access for free uh, massive data sets, uh, libraries uh, that require very little technical uh, expertise and free cloud computing resources. Um, so technically, um, uh, data science is out at our fingertips, um, which makes it very exciting, but also carries with it no, uh, other uh, implications that uh, usually are overlooked. Are overlooked in general, no, from the from uh, the, the corporate organizational um, point of view. Uh, it's all often happens also in education and uh, also in policy making. No, so that's why uh, we believe it's 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 an important topic to cover. Although it's by no means uh, th there's no way we can uh, provide uh, correct answers to many of the challenges that arise from the uh, ethical uh, misuse no, of, of uh, data-driven applications. Um, I would argue that um, data science is very different uh, from basically any other discipline when it comes to ethical considerations uh, because um, what we have uh, uh, is the potential to run experiments at large scale with a lot of people, uh, a lot of users who by default they opt in. No? So that's, that's quite different from other user studies in, in, health, in the health sciences, uh, maybe with animal uh, testing, with trials um, and so on. Uh, because we all are active users of, of technology and all our activity becomes recorded uh, somewhere. Uh, in the, the cloud providers, the technology providers that we use, um, it, it, it would be very naive to not expect that our activity is not being part of, a, of an experiment, right? Um, so by default, we almost always opt in and it's up to us to opt out specifically from certain activities. But of course, if you opt out, you kind of are missing some of the perks that, uh, that the free technology has to offer. Um, and, you know, 
let, think from the point of view of those, no, uh, having access to all this data, all this activity, user activity, uh, cell phone usage, uh, web browsing history, um, purchase activity, social media activity. Um, and now we want to model stuff. No, We want to build a model that's capable to predict whether I am more likely to buy this car or this other uh, product, or whether I am more likely to travel when you know time uh, the, the, the world comes back to normal, whether I would be more likely to travel to this uh, location. Uh, and therefore, you know, a certain ad would be more, more efficient. Um, every time we kind of build this kind of experiment, we, we, by definition, we don't have access to the whole world. Although, you know, um, we're, we're get, getting closer to having, uh, to, to getting close to having a, a, a representative enough sample that's almost every time, no, it's closer to the whole population. Um, but that's not the case, no? So we need to make assumptions. We need to make assumptions about the problem. And again, here I'm talking from the point of view of an AI or data science practitioner. When we run an experiment, we need to make assumptions to make sure to simply uh, be able to narrow down the problem to a manageable proportion. Um, so we make assumptions. We make assumptions about the population that represents the problem or what are the most prominent features or uh, pre predictors no? uh, that uh, that population has with uh, uh, looking at, at, at the solution of that particular problem. And these assumptions that we make are typically uh, referred to as bias. Uh, it's, a, it's a super overloaded term. Um, but at this point, no, I believe we all more or less uh, kind of assume uh, we are on, going to be on the same page and we're going to interpret the term bias as, 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 as the same thing. Uh, but bias, uh, it's, of course, it's by definition, it's not a bad thing, right? So obviously, no, uh, sometimes our own biases would, uh, in a case where we, you know, come across either of these two, um, uh, nice um, uh, dogs, uh, our own um, uh, survival instincts will tell us uh, that we should behave probably in different ways uh, if we come across these two, these two guys. And this is a bias, no? And of course, this is a bias that we have uh, embedded in our own uh, biological mechanisms. Uh, they have to do with the survival instincts and they are not by definition a bad thing. Um, but of course, their implications when these biases come uh, make their way to uh, automatic models, no? uh, models that uh, especially when they are used to make decisions that affect us no? uh, from the uh, social and ethical point of view, but also the economic uh, perspective. Um, and this is an, a very nice example that I saw in, in, in one uh, uh, talk uh, I attended a few months ago. Um, called Ethics in the Vision and Language of uh, Artificial Intelligence. Um, and here the speaker, no, uh, she asked, no, what do you see here? Uh, you know, she said, bananas, no? uh, bananas, uh, a bunch of bananas. Um, you know, uh, th there's not much, much else that you would say, right? However, uh, in a picture like this, um, something clicks no, in our brain and we don't say bananas anymore, or at least we not only say bananas anymore, no? uh, because uh, there are certain uh, assumptions that we've made about what a prototypical banana should look like, that when, you know, when we see something like this, um, there's uh, all our attention goes into uh, the feature that becomes most prominent and to our own uh, interpretation of the world, most abnormal. Um, so what's, what, what just happened no, in our brain? Um, um, so it's, there's a bit of research out there that suggests that um, we can't really have a, a, a record of every single element, every single item, every single entity in the world and record all the differences between them. This would be simply not manageable for our brain. Um, so we do, we, we, we have shortcuts, no? our brain um, encodes a lot of shortcuts for us to in, be able to interpret the world. Um, there's some research that suggests that what happens here is that we're storing central properties, you know, like the yellowness of a banana and, and prototypical traits. 
Uh, whereas uh, there's a kind of uh, contradictory um, 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 trend that actually suggests that what we do is we store the ex exemplars. No? So we, uh, our brain is more, our brain tends more to uh, store, um, instead of storing uh, prototypical properties, stores actual exam examples of stuff that we've seen and which seem to, which should, uh, well, give a good account no? or a, a faithful account of the world around us. Either way, um, it's fairly obvious that we need to make shortcuts to be able to interpret the world the way we do it. Um, but of course, by taking the, the shortcuts, uh, we are imposing uh, cultural, historical, uh, social uh, biases. And now the challenge is how those biases can be prevented to making uh, data science and artificial intelligence models uh, to making to make them worse in the sense that they would be uh, amplifying uh, the human biases that we already have in our in our daily life behavior uh, personal exchanges etc um, and there's a lot of literature on this um, there, and I'm going to give a couple of examples on, on these types of biases uh, for example we're going to look at reporting bias sample selection bias uh, label bias, uh, problem definition bias, and bias in the features. And I left a comma there because it really, you know, it doesn't end there. And as research goes on, um, other types of, of problems inherent in data science and artificial intelligence will come up. Um, so reporting bias, uh, for example, is something that almost all AI systems that deal with, uh, that are based on web data will suffer from. Because we don't tend to, to state the obvious, right? And if you, I build an AI system, uh, for example, uh, to uh, kind of learn what is the most typical stuff that humans do. Um, there's, been, there's been studies uh, that suggest that if that was the case and we wanted to base uh, what, you know, humans typically do uh, based on the occurrence of verbs, for example, in web text, it would be much likely that uh, we would be murdering people that breathing simply because they were, uh, because there are more associations uh, with uh, human entities and the word murder than the word breathe. Of course, we know it's not true, but how, where does the common sense um, interpretation of the world come into place um, to mitigate this obvious mismatch between what happens in reality and what the data is telling us that's happening. No? Um, in terms of sample selection, um, and this is something that's uh, uh, probably more traditional, a more traditional type of problem, where you can't really tell whether the sample that you take of a population is a good representative of the population itself. No? Um, um, for example, um, in criminology, uh, and these are examples or from uh, this excellent book on machine learning from Haldo Med III. Um, and I quote, no, in criminology, the only people for which we have uh, training data are those that have already been arrested, charged with and convicted of a crime. So of course, this is going to be, uh, 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 well, uh, a very good, uh, quote, quote, good uh, foundation for amplifying that particular problem, right? Um, you could have uh, label biases, you know, uh, typically um, in machine learning and AI, uh, we uh, like supervised settings. This means that we like to have access to a lot of data, but not only that, data which has been massively annotated by humans so that we can tell the algorithm, look, uh, if, you, if you're going to learn um, to tell apart uh, photos of uh, dogs versus photos of cats. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you thousands of photos of dogs and cats manually labeled by humans saying, here's a dog, here's a cat. And then the, the model will pick up on certain, you know, visual features that are going to be uh, correlated with the labels. Um, but um, this labeling um, is not trivial, especially if we come uh, into, um, um, well, um, um, human, cultural, or even folklore um, 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 aspects. Um, this is an example from a competition that Google launched a few years ago uh, on inclusive images competition, uh, because they realized that uh, many of the models that were uh, standard out there for image classification were trained on Western-centric data. And they realized that, you know, uh, only uh, prototypical, for example, weddings in the Western cultures were actually uh, tagged by the algorithm with these labels, whereas it 
was the, the, the models were uh, totally unable to identify uh, other ceremonies in non-Western cultures. And of course, this is a problem if you want uh, these um, algorithms to be deployed uh, in non-Western environments where, of course, the, the, the way people dress, uh, act, uh, speak, uh, and, and inherent cultural traits are, are, are fundamentally different from, from, from the predominant um, um, culture behind the development uh, of, these, of these systems. Um, we can make a, a, a wrong assumption from the beginning in terms of how we define the problem. Uh, for example, an intelligent billboard to predict gender of, of a person, uh, walking towards it uh, to show uh, better ad uh, ads, may be trained simply as a binary classifier between male and female and would, then, would thereby exclude anyone who does not fall into the, the gender binary. You know? and, uh, and something as simple as this uh, could already be a source of discrimination and harm uh, for uh, those who you know, would not be um, um, embodied into the into the into the problem that that particular machine learning algorithm wouldn't would, was was designed to solve, um, or bias in the features, and I believe this is the last type of of uh, bias that I cover, um, which is you know um, um, uh, modeling certain problems with the wrong features uh, or looking at the wrong things. Uh, and trying to find a correlation which is which is not there, but you know the proxy uh, seems to be so obvious um, that we rely on those uh, features to build the systems which are uh, at the end of the, uh, down the line are likely to misbehave. Um, so this is an example uh, from uh, a few. Uh, so it, it's not uh, recent. That's something that where Google has put a lot of emphasis in, in the last years, but which is uh, gender neutral translation. So Google Translate machine translation systems have a challenge to deal with uh, language pairs where in one language, the pronouns are actually uh, have actually a, a gender tag. No? For example, in Spanish, the can be masculine or feminine, depending on the gender of the word they are uh, modifying. For when we translate the manager's thank the receptionist to Spanish, um, there was not a long ago a time in, 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 in the history of Google Translate where it would always translate the manager to the masculine and the receptionist to the feminine uh, gender. Um, so you can imagine the type of uh, problems that this uh, carries with it. In case you're not uh, familiar with uh, why this is a huge problem beyond the translation uh, case study itself, it's because the technology behind Google Translate is very similar to the technology behind uh, Google Search, um, Google Assistant. All of them are built on top of uh, machine learning models that have similar representations. Let's think of it as how they uh, interpret the meaning of, of words. So if they are more likely to, 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 to link uh, a managerial position with a male, that's something that's going to uh, uh, well, have uh, implications, uh, not only in the translation itself, but also in the recommendations that we get from uh, the Google engine, um, um, etc. No? Um, and here's another example from uh, Turkish, where, uh, and uh, this is an example of how Google uh, addressed no, this uh, situation, which was to propose uh, gender uh, specific translations, meaning that uh, it uh, kind of detached the translation for uh, Obir Doctor, uh, which is uh, a, trans uh, a sentence in Turkish which does not carry um, um, gender um, uh, information when it, it gets translated uh, to, to English, the translation accounts for the possible the two possible genders in the in the language. No, so there's, but of course, again, no, I mean, this is a, a very challenging uh, problem. And there are many languages in the world, and there are many different ways in which gender, um, class, and social uh, expectations can uh, get uh, uh, find their way into into evidencing no um, um, inequalities and social biases. Um, so at this point, I believe no, it's quite obvious that the problem is is there. Um, uh, it, it's a problem that's uh, inherent to the nature of data science, because as I said, no, um, not only big techs, uh, all of us have access to massive data sets, uh, computing power, 
and state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms. And with a little bit of technical knowledge, it's not uh, really uh, a chimera to, to, to build a, a system, an app, deploy it on the App Store or uh, the, the Android market and you know uh, start um, well, making predictions based on the data it was trained on. I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, an app that would recognize objects, faces, for example, in, in your camera, or an object detection system, or a machine translation system beyond Google Translate. So how can we, you know, how has the research community in, in computer science and AI uh, address this? Um, so the ACM, which is uh, the best known uh, body in, 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 so in engineering, um, um, has a code of ethics, which goes back uh, beyond, uh, further back than the advent of, of, uh, of uh, deep learning and data-driven uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, but the code, this code of ethics kind of applies uh, very well to the current situation. Um, and the, the point is that, well, there's, it, it's a call for those of us who are involved in data science, AI, computer science, etc., in one way or another, to make sure that we minimize malfunctions uh, to the best of our uh, capacity. No? And to do that, um, it's encouraged that we look ahead into the possible social consequences that these research, these models, this data that we're collecting and these models that we're developing can have uh, in the future, no? which is something that, you know, um, you could think as a data scientist, for example, that's not your job, right? Uh, your job should be, um, um, well, generating uh, valuable insights from data so that the corporate, the, the organization I am working with has access to uh, information that is going to be, uh, you know, is going to enable them to add value to their uh, activity. Right? Um, so this is an open question, right? So how do we uh, kind of put together a framework where uh, everyone, all the actors involved in the in the development of AI, uh, from policymakers to engineers, uh, are aware of uh, this and kind of collaborate together. Uh, for ethical machine learning and ethical AI. And as I said, there's research out there, there are some proposals, but there's definitely, but there's certainly not a, a unified approach uh, global, globally. And it's even difficult to find a unified approach within individual countries. Um, I like this proposal uh, from Leonelli. Uh, um, uh, speaks about accountability, no, and about the duty to justify an action to others and be answerable for the results of that action. But you know, um, data science is a, a very interesting discipline. Uh, AI is an interesting discipline in the sense that uh, we have a very long chain of actors, and some some people don't even know that they are part of an experiment. Uh, Usually, the data scientists are not trained on the legal implications uh, of uh, of uh, of what they what they do could uh, create. Right? Um, as in my experience, there's very little co communication between the data science team and teams and legal uh, or ethical uh, uh, teams uh, to put together a sets of best practices. And we should be able to answer certain questions to anybody that asks them, no? Uh, either from a research point of view, when we publish a paper on we, or when we deploy the next version of our application, um, what happens if, you know, um, our application works best with a certain uh, population than with other? Uh, why is that the case? It's because the data had more uh, examples of that particular population. Yeah, but the po that population is the population that's, you know, the the, the, the ruling population, the population in power. So should we uh, really let that happen? Because if we let it happen, there's going to be an increased risk of over amplifying biases that are already there. Um, but um, they, these uh, underrepresented communities, they are not really uh, the, most of the, of the times the target uh, for our applications because they only represent a small percentage. So how do you balance this, this attention no, between um, uh, being good at, uh, you know, uh, having models that are good at doing whatever tasks they're doing uh, for the most, for the uh, uh, highest number of individual, um, 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 
data points versus uh, having them behave equally correct for different subgroups, which would be representing different uh, 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 communities, uh, uh, human uh, communities. Um, so, you know, the point of several researchers is that this is very difficult. No, it's very difficult to pinpoint who is responsible for what, but as an end user, you should be able to get an answer. Um, so Lionel, you know, uh, um, uh, says that the distributed nature of data science seems to create insurmountable problems for any attempt to identify responsibilities for specific implications of technical decisions taken when processing data, right? Talks about distributed morality um, and proposes uh, a chain of custody. No, but of course, this is something that needs to happen uh, top down. Um, although uh, collaboration between uh, actors in data science would also be be useful. Okay, um, machine learning and AI conferences have started to 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 show clear awareness on this. Um, so, for example, requesting uh, researchers to um, um, well, account for the possible uh, societal impact of the research when we submit a paper to these conferences. And it's also important to understand that there are many companies that are doing a lot, making a lot of money and creating a lot of wealth at the same time from AI. And one of the reasons why this is a very profitable uh, uh, business, it's because it's riding the hype train. And usually, uh, well, policymakers and decision makers, um, they, you know, it's, it's difficult to keep up with what the um, uh, communities are doing. Um, and only if you're like very deep into the, into a certain area like computer vision or natural language processing or operational research, then you know exactly what's, what can be, you, what you can realistically expect from an AI model and what you can't. But this is not something that the general population uh, is aware of. Um, and there's this clear example now from uh, 2019 when OpenAI, which is a, a large uh, AI organization, kind of uh, told the world that they had developed a model that was able to speak with uh, almost human performance, able to uh, well, um, um, generate text that would uh, pass any uh, human test and would be able to kind of engage with you in, in a conversation, but at the same time, because of the risks that deploying such model uh, into the world would have, they decided to, with, they published the paper, but they decided to withhold the, the, the model so that it couldn't be, uh, uh, you know, used in, in, with, with, with a dual use, not that we saw at the beginning of the slides. Um, but of course, this creates a bubble of hype and misunderstanding from the media um, such as this, no? Elon Musk founded a a OpenAI, builds artificial intelligence so powerful it must be kept locked up for the good of humanity with your classical Terminator photo. No? And of course, this is again a problem because unless you are very deep into what's going on, um, why would not you believe something like this? No? And it, it really gives a wrong picture of what AI can do. And it doesn't help for uh, the need of, uh, you know, all this um, uh, consideration for ethical, social, and legal implications of what we're doing. And in fact, even Elon Musk had to go public and say that he was not involved for, uh, closely involved with OpenAI for, for, a for a long time and that he had nothing to do with this uh, PR movement. Um, okay, so... Uh, I'm going to finish uh, the presentation with two, two, two topics. One of them is mentioning the UK data ethics framework, which, which I believe is a very good initiative. It's been around for a while. Um, uh, the, it's, a, it's a governmental um, piece of docu uh, document where, which um, establishes a certain world criteria and soft requirements that everyone work building an, uh, an, an AI data science project within the UK government should, should consider. No? It's uh, evaluated over several uh, principles and five key actions, uh, which are understanding whether who is the user and where's the, the public benefit for your project, involving diverse expertise, uh, complying with the law, reviewing the quality and limitations of data, and evaluating and considering wider policy implications. Um, and each of these actions, no? so each of these things that when we build a data science project we need to look into, we are going to evaluate them against three benchmarks or three criteria, transparency, accountability, and fairness. So how do they look in practice? How does that look in, uh, like in, in practice? No? 
Um, so fairness, uh, I'm just copy pasting the, the, the definitions in the document, but of course I'm not going to read everything. It should be relatively self-explanatory. So what we want is to eliminate our project's potential to have unintended uh, consequences. And, and of course, this is you know, this is a, a, a massive topic, uh, but the bottom line is, is that. Um, in accountability, this links to the chain of responsibility and to be able to, uh, well, uh, um, provide uh, effective governance and oversight mechanisms for any project. And finally, transparency, meaning that uh, our actions, processes, and data make them as public as possible for inspection and for, and for scrutiny by the wider public. No? So there should be some mechanisms in place that allow uh, uh, external um, um, agencies to kind of check uh, the, the, the mechanisms of your project, but also the public should be able to, to understand as much as possible of your project. Right? So to give you an example, for the action involving diverse expertise, uh, we would like to uh, publish information about who is in, 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 in the panel of experts that are consulting against no, uh, the different aspects of our project in terms of accountability, um, um, who do we have mechanisms in place, for example, to challenge our projects, no? to, to put them under a certain pressure or tension? And are we uh, able to claim that these projects are robust enough or they would break if they were put into, into scenarios that are, were not intended at the, at the first place? Or uh, what if the project, you know, which starts being ethical, um, uh, you know, it evolves into, uh, well, something that uh, stops being ethical. Are there mechanisms in place for terminating the project? And for fairness, um, well, uh, ensuring diversity in the team uh, and embracing diversity of experiences within the the, the technical the technical teams. No? Okay. And the the second topic I wanted to touch on, um, which I believe I will have a bit of time uh, to do, is something I found very interesting, which is the the case of of YouTube recommendations. Right. Um, and um, I, I really hope I have enough time to, to give uh, a bit on detail on this because I found it a very interesting topic. So 2019, YouTube, uh, you know, publishes a, a blog post uh, and in the blog post, they say this, no, we'll begin reducing recommendations of borderline content and content that could misinform users in harmful ways. Uh, such as videos promoting a phony miracle cure for a serious illness, claiming the earth is flat or making blatantly false claims about historic events like 9-11. Okay, so this, you know, looks like a good movement, no? So why, why is this uh, 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 an issue? So it turns out that one of the um, um, employees uh, uh, most closely involved with the development of YouTube's AI kind of exposed uh, on Twitter, uh, and then there's been documentaries about it, um, about, uh, about what was happening, no? Before uh, YouTube uh, made this uh, move. Um, and he said that uh, he worked for the AI that promoted these uh, conspiracy theories and, uh, uh, well, um, um, harmful content by the billions, no? And uh, he explained, no, why, why, why it was a, a huge victory, etc. No? Um, so without going into the details yet, um, uh, in the blog post, uh, YouTube said that, uh, well, the, they argued no, that uh, this change would strike a balance between maintaining a platform for free speech and living up to the responsibility to users. No? So again, how would YouTube as a platform uh, you know, uh, manage this tension between this is a platform for release for publishing videos versus how much no uh, is on our uh, on, on our uh, hands in terms of you know, controlling and moderating the content that gets published there. Um, what happens is that um, this content turns to be content which is uh, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, conspiracy theories, flat earth, uh, you name it. Um, uh, they are hyper engaging. Uh, th that those are those are hyper engaging type of videos. So people who uh, and I read no people who spend their lives on YouTube, they have a higher impact on how the recommendations work because they are the people that watch more videos. So this content uh, gets more views because you know um, it gets more promoted. Um, then. If I want to make money from YouTube videos, why would I not, you know, choose to uh, uh, b uh, publish videos on conspiracy theories if it's uh, blatantly obvious that they are going to generate more revenue? Uh, and so people spend more time on that content. And back to step one. 
And he ran an experiment where he showed that, for example, uh, YouTube recommendations was, was, uh, were uh, recommending way more uh, flat earth uh, theory content than Google search or the search engine in YouTube. Uh, which was also a trend for uh, results stating that global warming was a hoax, or even for Pizzagate, which in case you're not familiar with it, is a you know, uh, quite uh, worked out uh, theory on, you know, um, uh, involving the Democratic Party in the US and child abuse and, and pizza joints in, in Washington DC. Very, very, very uh, interesting. Turns out Google search was not promoting this content at all, whereas YouTube recommendation was recommended a lot. No? Um, and yeah, it's, it, it seemed obvious no, that um, content spreading conspiranoia and misinformation will appeal to hyper-engaged users more, uh, which has a consequence on addiction, radicalization, political abuse, uh, and conspiracy theories, which get amplified because of the harmful content that YouTube had been recommended for years. Um, but of course, uh, as I say, no, where does YouTube's responsibility start? Should we consider it as a mere platform or are there other parties that should be involved? Should the government uh, pitch in at some point? So as you can see, this is not an easy thing to answer. Um, so I'm going to finish the, the talk now and I'm going to leave uh, some reflective questions that uh, after this uh, session, um, I leave for uh, the students of the MSCs in data science and analytics and on software engineering. Um, so two different programs, but two programs where uh, at some point, no, dealing with data becomes a thing and therefore having a, a well, uh, building no, and growing an ethical approach to data management is, is a, is definitely something that will pay off uh, in, uh, we would say now in the short, in the long term, but um, the voices uh, the, uh, in favor of, of putting in place ethical approaches to, to data science and AI now are uh, louder and louder every day. No? So these are some reflective questions that uh, I leave for, for our students to, to reflect on. And typically we'll have a discussion in, in class about what, what about these, these topics. No? So, and these are questions that map directly to the UK data uh, ethics framework, which as I say, provides a very good and principled framework to kind of understand uh, whether a data science project can be uh, deployed uh, into the wild with uh, a certain uh, well degree of quarantine. No? So what questions do we cover? So we, we ask no, if we could uh, um, kind of you know, corrupt uh, YouTube's data on purpose um, to kind of uh, um, mess with the recommendation system so that it's not favoring so much uh, um, uh, these uh, uh, conspiracy theory videos, no? because at the end of the day, what it's doing is uh, it has a success metric, which is viewing time. So can we play with that metric to, to make things uh, a bit fairer no? for everyone? Um, can we think of what kind of data would YouTube be using for building these recommendation systems, uh, user activity, comments, uh, etc. cetera? Um, in terms of transparency, would certain would it recommendation system be uh, reproducible? No, so would a research team in a university be able to reproduce the system? Is there a paper that describes the steps to build YouTube's recommendation system? Um, um, you know, how do we, how would uh, YouTube as a company uh, or Google as a company explain to the public beyond a blog post and PR uh, what was happening uh, if we had not known about this by uh, uh, an insider that exposed uh, some of these issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so this uh, marks the end of the presentation. Um, it was... Uh, Big pleasure to talk about this and happy to take questions now. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, that was um, really very interesting. Um, you've certainly given me a lot to think about there in terms of um, all the different types of biases and, um, and thinking about kind of the use of data as well, really, um, particularly really important to kind of solving some of the kind of UK grand challenges and, and like sort of, uh, sort of the zero carbon agenda and all the kind of things that we need to resolve. But but kind of it might be quite easy to potentially overlook some of the ethical considerations of the data and, and kind of the responsibilities of thinking about that when, you know, when governments and policy people make decisions are using data. And um, yeah, no, that was that was really very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we've had some some good questions come in. Um, we've got three questions so far. I'd like to uh, to put to you, please. Um, 
So the first one, uh, there are other ethical models uh, other than the UK government's ethics data, um, data ethics framework that you recommend as being good to examine. Um, so, sorry, so the question was, are there other ethical models um, other than the UK government's data ethics framework that you recommend as being good to examine or other parts of the uh, world or what we yeah, what are other parts of the world doing in, in this area of work? Mm, so, well, uh, about the UK data ethics framework, um, I've been uh, looking into like past versions of it. Um, and it's really interesting to see how it has been evolving. So I, I would say uh, uh, that it, uh, even looking at past iterations no, from 2019 and so on of the same document, it really shows um, how the, the UK has been updating no, some of the uh, priorities uh, so far. So I would definitely, con you know, uh, to if, if from a, even from a historical point of view, I would look into, into past uh, versions of the same document because they are rather different and they really give a very good account of how uh, fast no, things have gone. Uh, in terms of uh, of what what are governments uh, most concerned about when it comes to ethics in in, in AI, um, my my and for this as for the second question, I think maybe I can mention. Uh, so my my area of research is natural language processing. No? So the branch of AI that deals with human language. That's why I give so many examples about machine translation and, and so on. Um, so lately, um, there's uh, been kind of a, a push. Uh, so we, we build uh, data sets, no? So we take text and annotate that text manually in many different ways. Maybe we take uh, thousands of tweets and annotate them with containing uh, hateful comments or not. And then we build systems on top of these data and deploy them into, you know, run experiments or even they become uh, commercial products. Um, so there's a big push on uh, whenever we build these data sets and we publish papers that describe these data sets to do that alongside a data statement where we give a very specific account on the demographics of the people involved in the uh, generation of the data, the annotation of the data, whether we are aware of any uh, possible community or group that has not been um, well represented, um, and well, and different and other no uh, legal aspects that, at top of my head, I can't I can't really uh, say. Uh, but I would, uh, if if that person is curious, I would definitely look into into uh, data statements literature uh, for natural language processing because I also believe it should be. Um, kind of transferable to other AI disciplines like vision, etc. Because at the end of the day, it's about um, showing uh, a careful account for where the data comes from and who is annotating that data and whether that can cause, uh, you know, have an implication in, 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 in the models that are uh, built on top of that data. Thank you very much. Uh, that's great. Thank you. Um, so a second question. Um, so we've got somebody who's working in healthcare with confidential uh, patient data. So ethics is, is really important a consideration for, for them. Um, are you aware of people who are working in AI ethics specifically in this area that you can re recommend sort of that we can look up? Mm. Uh, it's a good question. Um... I mean, I, I, I'm uh, prior to, to joining uh, Cardiff, I used to work for a healthcare uh, startup in, in Spain, based in Spain. And what the, the, the model was and still is uh, processing health records uh, uh, for building AI systems like uh, decision support systems or uh, intelligence uh, of different kinds. Um, and there, for example, I remember that one of the main issues was anonymizing that this data, no? and, and there were different uh, approaches to, 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 to make sure that the models that we built uh, could not be used to trace back uh, individual patients. Um, so I would say, um, again, no, within my area, um, there's... Uh, there are a number of workshops on uh, healthcare and natural language processing, which are all about, well, uh, processing uh, medical uh, records, uh, maybe monitoring social media for uh, mental health uh, onsets, no? So predicting whether a certain user in social media might be 
uh, more likely to, to develop a, a mental condition based on the type of content that that user is posting on social media. But of course, it, it has its own uh, social implications with it. Um, I would uh, look into the Association of Computational Linguistics and look at the workshops that are related with health, because uh, there's uh, increasing an increasing body of work in those workshops that address specifically the ethical considerations, anonymization, um, um, well, balancing data sets of different nature, what do you do when you need to deal with social media, etc. Uh, so I would look into that, the ACL, and then look into the healthcare uh, workshops, because specifically I am not aware of any particular policy in place for, for health. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Luis. Mm -hmm. Um, and our final question, this is very interesting as well. Um, who do you think should govern AI and does self-governing actually work? Um, so yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, to be honest, um, my the, the more I research the topic, the more I become convinced that the key is in education. Like in, in if we are able to embed uh, in a serious manner and not simply as a tick, as a box that you need to tick as a lecturer when you're dealing with, uh, when you're teaching AI or machine learning or, or data science, but rather making a, a core element in the curriculum. Um, I think that would be a great uh, place to start because then you would be training data scientists and engineers who are, who would be uh, strongly aware uh, of of the imp social implications that could uh, that th that their models have no when they develop them, um, and then it's easier to communicate a message uh, up the food chain, uh, because if we expect it to be a top down thing, um, it's risky uh, because it's likely that you know uh, policymakers and people with uh, uh, with all, many other responsibilities may have to delegate this. And this is a very interesting research area, but it's not mature at all. The literature is, is, is growing, but there's not enough, uh, you know, literature out there to convince us of what is going to be the best way to do things. So I think that uh, training data scientists uh, with a very strong component of ethical AI would make, uh, well, would, would lay the best foundations possible for uh, strategically addressing uh, many of these issues. Uh, without having to rely on an external body, which I believe it would be suboptimal, because then there are other issues like, you know, free speech uh, and so on. No? That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation today. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, yeah, we have some really you, great everyone. questions. <laughs> um, yeah, just finally to say that if you really enjoyed today's session, you might be interested in um, a, a section of postgraduate uh, taught modules uh, that people can take on a standalone basis for professional development purposes. Um, it's from the MSc in Data Analytics for Government. Um, and as I say, there's a selection of modules there that people might be interested in. And um, we're happy to send out some details to people after the session today. Um, but thank you very much again uh, for the session, Lewis, and for um, uh, for everybody joining today. And uh, I wish you a good day. And I'm going to sign off now. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.